Hi there, my name is Adrienne Holmes. I am a fourth grade teacher in Panama. And today I am going to be reading chapters 12 and 13 of the new J.K. Rowling book, The Ichabod, on behalf of the Shed Panama, everybody's favorite youth theater group. So please bear with me, I'm gonna share my screen and you can read along with me if you'd like. Chapter 12, The King's Lost Sword. Within seconds, it was as though each of the king's party was wearing a thick white blindfold. The fog was so dense they couldn't see their own hands in front of their faces. The mist smelled of the foul marsh of brackish water and ooze. The soft ground seemed to shift beneath their feet as many of the men turned unwisely on the spot. Trying to catch sight of each other, they lost all sense of direction. Each man felt adrift in a blinding white sea, and Major Beamish was one of the few to keep his head. Have a care, he called. The ground is treacherous. Stay still. Don't attempt to move. But King Fred, who was suddenly feeling rather scared, paid no attention. He set off at once in what he thought was the direction of Major Beamish. But within a few steps, he felt himself sinking into the icy marsh. Help! he cried as the freezing marsh water flooded over the tops of his shining boots. Help! Beamish! Where are you? I'm sinking! There was an immediate clamor of panicked voices and jangling armor. The guards all hurried off in every direction, trying to find the king, bumping into each other and slipping over but the floundering king's voice drowned out every other. I've lost my boots. Why doesn't somebody help me? Where are you all? The Lord Spittleworth and Flapoon were the only two people who'd followed Beamish's advice and remained quite still in the places they'd occupied when the fog had rolled over them. Spittleworth was clutching a fold of Flapoon's ample pantaloons, and Flapoon was holding tight to the skirt of Spittleworth's riding coat. Neither of them made the smallest attempt to help Fred, but waited, shivering, for calm to be restored. At least if the fool gets swallowed by the bog, we'll be able to go home. Spittleworth muttered to Flapoon. The confusion deepened. Several of the royal guard had now got stuck in the bog as they tried to find the king. The air was full of squelches, clanks, and shouts. Major Beamish was bellowing in a vain attempt to restore some kind of order, and the king's voice seemed to be receding into the blind night, becoming ever fainter, as though he was blundering away from them. And then out of the heart of the darkness came an awful terror-struck shriek. Beamish, help me, I can see the monster. I'm coming, your majesty, cried Major Beamish. Keep shouting, sire, I'll find you. Help me, Beamish! Help me! shouted King Fred. What's happened to the idiot? Flapoon asked Spittleworth. But before Spittleworth could answer, the fog around the two lords thinned as quickly as it had arrived, so that they stood together in a little clearing, able to see each other, but still surrounded on all sides by high walls of thick white mist. The voices of the king, of Beamish, and of the other soldiers were becoming fainter and fainter. 
Don't move yet, Spittleworth cautioned Thapoon. Once the fog thins a little bit more, we'll be able to find the horses and we can retreat to a safe. At that precise moment, a slimy black figure burst out of the wall of fog and launched itself at the two lords. Flapoon let out a high-pitched scream and Spittleworth lashed out at the creature, missing only because it flopped to the ground, weeping. It was then that Spittleworth realized the gibbering, panting slime monster was, in fact, King Fred the Fearless. Thank heavens we've found you, your majesty. We've been searching everywhere, cried Spittleworth. Ick, 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 whimpered the king. He's got hiccups, said Flapoon. Give him a fright. Ick, ick, ickabog moaned Fred. I s s saw it. A gigantic monster. It nearly caught me. I beg your majesty's pardon, asked Spittleworth. The m m monster is real, gulped Fred. I'm lucky to, to be, be alive. To the horses, we must flee, and quickly. King Fred tried to hoist himself up, by climbing Spittleworth's leg, but Spittleworth stepped swiftly aside to avoid getting covered in slime, instead aiming a consoling pat at the top of Fred's head, which was the cleanest part of him. Oh, there, there, your majesty, you've had a most distressing experience falling in the marsh. As we were saying earlier, the Boulders do indeed assume monstrous forms in this thick fog. Dash it, Spittleworth, I know what I saw, shouted the king, staggering to his feet, unaided. Tall as two horses it was, and with eyes like huge lamps. I drew my sword. But my hands were so slimy, it slipped from my grasp, so there was nothing for it but to pull my feet out of my stuck boots and crawl away. Just then, a fourth man made his way into their little clearing in the fog, Captain Roach, father of Roderick, who was Major Beamish's second in command. A big, burly man with jet black mustaches. What Captain Roach was really like, we are about to find out. All you need to know now is that the king was very glad to see him because he was the largest member of the royal guard. Did you see any sign of the Ichabog, Roach? whimpered Fred. Oh, no, your majesty, he said with a respectful bow. All I've seen is fog and mud. I'm glad to know your majesty is safe. At any rate, you gentlemen stay here and I'll round up the troops. Roach made to leave, but King Fred yelped. No, you stay here with me. Roach, in case the monster comes this way. You've still got a rifle, haven't you? Excellent. I lost my sword and my boots, you see. My very best dress sword with the jeweled hilt. Though he felt much safer with Captain Roach beside him, the trembling king was otherwise as cold and scared as he could ever remember being. He also had a nasty feeling that nobody believed he'd really seen the Ichabog, a feeling that increased when he caught sight of Spittleworth rolling his eyes at Flapoon. The king's pride was stung. Spittleworth, Flapoon, he said, I want my sword and my boots back. 
They're over there somewhere, he added, waving his arm at the encircling fog. Would, would it not be better to wait until the fog has cleared? Your Majesty, asked Spittleworth nervously. I want my sword, snapped King Fred. It was my grandfather's, and it's very valuable. Go and find it, both of you. I shall wait here with Captain Roach, and don't come back empty-handed. So we're ready for chapter 13. It is called The Accident. The two lords had no choice but to leave the king and Captain Roach in their little clearing in the fog and proceed onto the marsh. Spittleworth took the lead, feeling his way with his feet for the firmest bits of ground. Flapoon followed close behind, still holding tightly to the hem of Spittleworth's coat and sinking deeply with every footstep because he was so heavy. The fog was clammy on their skin and rendered them almost completely blind. In spite of Spittle Spittleworth's best efforts, the two lords' boots were soon full to the brim with fetid water. That blasted nincompoop, muttered Spittleworth as they squelched along. That blithering buffoon, this is all his fault, the mouse-brained moron. It'll serve him right if that sword's lost for good, said Flapoon, now nearly waist-deep in marsh. We'd better hope it isn't, or we'll be here all night, said Spittleworth. Oh, curse this fog. They struggled onwards. The mist would thin for a few steps, then close again. Boulders loomed suddenly out of nowhere like ghostly elephants, and the rustling reeds sounded just like snakes. Though Spittleworth and Flapoon knew perfectly well that there was no such thing as an Ichabog, their insides didn't seem quite so sure. Let go of me, Spittleworth growled at Flapoon, who was constant tugging, was making him think of monstrous claws or jaws fastened on the back of his coat. Flapoon let go, but he too had been infected by a nonsensical fear, so he loosened his blunderbuss from its holster and held it ready. What's that? he whispered to Spittleworth as an odd noise reached them out of the darkness ahead. Both lords froze, the better to listen. A low growling and scrabbling was coming out of the fog. It conjured an awful vision in both men's minds of a monster feasting on the body of one of the royal guard. Who's there? Spittleworth called in a high-pitched voice. Somewhere in the distance, Major Bemis shouted back, Is that you, Lord Spittleworth? Yes! shouted Spittleworth. We can hear something strange. Beamish, can you? It seemed to the two lords that the odd growling and scrabbling grew louder. Then the fog lift shifted. A monstrous black silhouette with gleaming white eyes was revealed right in front of them, and it emitted a long yowl. With a deafening, crashing boom that seemed to shake the marsh, Flapoon let off his blunderbuss. The startled cries of their fellow men echoed across the hidden landscape, and then, as though Flapoon's shot had frightened it, the fog parted like curtains before the two lords, giving them a clear view of what lay ahead. The moon 
slid out from behind a cloud at that moment, and they saw a vast granite boulder with a mass of thorny branches at its base. Tangled up in these brambles was a terrified skinny dog whimpering and scrabbling to free itself, its eyes flashing in the reflected moonlight. A little beyond the giant boulder, face down in the bog, lay Major Beamish. What's going on? shouted several voices out of the fog. Who fired? Neither Spittleworth nor Flapoon answered. Spittleworth waded as quickly as he could towards Major Beamish. A swift examination was enough. The Major was stone dead, shot through the heart by Flapoon in the dark. My God, my God, what shall we do? bleated Flapoon, arriving at Spittleworth's side. Quiet, whispered Spittleworth. He was thinking harder and faster than he thought in the whole of his crafty, conniving life. His eyes moved slowly from Flapoon and the gun to the shepherd's trapped dog, to the king's boots and jeweled sword, which he now noticed half buried in the bog just a few feet away from the giant boulder. Spittleworth waded through the marsh to pick up the king's sword and used it to slash apart the brambles imprisoning the dog. Then, giving the poor animal a hearty kick, he sent it yelping away into the fog. Listen carefully, murmured Siddleworth, returning to Flapoon. But before he could explain his plan, another large figure emerged from the fog, Captain Roach. The king sent me, panted the captain. He's terrified. What? Then Roach saw Major Beamish lying dead on the ground. Spittleworth realized immediately that Roach must be let in on the plan and that in fact, he'd be very useful. Say nothing, Roach, said Spittleworth, while I tell you what has happened. The Ichabog has killed our brave, Major Beamish, in view of this tragic death, we shall need a new major, and of course, that will be you. Roach, for your second in command, I shall recommend a large pay rise for you because you were so valiant. valiant. Listen closely, Roach, so very valiant in chasing after the dreadful Ichabog. As it ran away into the fog, you see, the Ichabog was devouring the poor Major's body when Lord Flapoon and I came upon it. Frightened by Lord Flapoon's blunderbuss, which he sensibly discharged into the air, the monster dropped Beamish's body and fled. You bravely gave chase, trying to recover the king's sword, which was half buried in the monster's thick hide, but you weren't able to recover it, Roach. So sad for the poor king. I believe the priceless sword was his grandfather's, but I suppose it's now lost forever in the Ichabog's lair. So, saying, Spittleworth pressed the sword into Roach's large hands. The newly promoted major looked down at its jeweled hilt, and a cruel and crafty smile to match Spittleworth's own spread over his face. Yes, a great pity that I wasn't able to recover the sword, my lord, he said sliding it out of sight beneath his tunic.
Now let's wrap up the poor Major's body, because it would be dreadful for the other men to see the marks of the monster's fangs upon him. How sensitive of you, Major Roach, said Lord Spittleworth. And the two men swiftly took off their cloaks and wrapped up the body while Flapoon watched, heartily relieved that nobody need know he'd accidentally killed Beamish. Could you remind me what the Ichabog looked like, Lord Spittleworth, asked Roach, when Major Beamish's body was well hidden, for the three of us saw it together, and will, of course, have received identical impressions. Very true, said Lord Spittleworth. Well, according to the king, the beast is as tall as two horses, with eyes like lamps. In fact, said Flapoon, pointing, it looks a lot like this large boulder with a dog's eyes gleaming at the base. Tall as two horses with eyes like lamps, repeated Roach. Very well, my lords. If you'll assist me to put Beamish over my shoulder, I'll carry him to the king, and we can explain how the major met his death. Thank you for listening, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the story. <laughs>